Hi, I'm Dr. Cedric McFadden. I'm a board certified surgeon here at Prisma Health. Uh, we want to do something a little bit different today. We want to talk about a colonoscopy. We want to equip you with everything you need to know before you get there so that you not only are aware of what's going to happen when you arrive, but you also have an understanding of what's going to happen during your procedure and after your procedure. There are two main reasons why people come to have a colonoscopy. One, they've reached the magic age to have the test done. Now that age used to be 50, but now that age is 45. So if you've reached the age of 45, you need to have an initial screening colonoscopy. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer, meaning your mom, dad, brother, sister have had colorectal cancer, you should begin that screening at least 10 years before they were diagnosed. So if mom was 60 when she was diagnosed, you're gonna obviously begin sooner, or if mom was much younger at 45, you're not going to wait to 45, you'll begin at 35, okay? Even if you don't have any symptoms, you still need to have that important test. Now, there are some symptoms that may indicate you need a colonoscopy even before that age of 45. So if you have symptoms of anorectal bleeding, changes in your bowel habits, abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, anemia, that's gonna get you a colonoscopy regardless of your age. And that's called a diagnostic colonoscopy. So one of the reasons why colonoscopy has gotten such a bad rep is because of the prep. Uh, often people don't want to take a full day off from work to drink a bunch of liquids. It's gonna make them poop all day, right? Who can blame you, right? But the prep is very important. It's very important that we have a great prep so that we can see everything we need to see. We can find any problems that may be present and we can ultimately help you. Uh, there are several different prep options that are available. Uh, uh, not all of the preps are liquids. Some preps are actually pill formats and you should talk with your doctor about the best prep that's right for you. Uh, here's an example of one of the preps. I thought I'd just take you through it right quick. This is what we call a split dosed prep. This is a prep where you take part of it the evening before and you take the other part of the prep the morning of the procedure itself. This particular prep uh, involves you taking this powder, and it's very clear, they'll tell you dose one, dose two, so it's very easy to do that. And you'll take the prep, and this is supposed to be like a mango, I'll tell you so. It's gonna be good, right? All right, so we're gonna pour that in. It's a powder. I wanna get all of it in. And then this particular prep tells us, and they make it really easy for you. They tell you kind of where to fill the line, Going to pour this in about 16 ounces of water. You're going to pour into that line, and once you get there, you're going to mix this up. You can just sense the excitement of getting this down, right? And you can take it in, and obviously you can take and I advocate. One of the reasons why people have a hard time taking their prep is because they drink at room temperature. So if you're gonna take a prep, you know, drink it cold like you would a normal beverage. You also don't wanna chug it, you know, like you, you wanna get it all down, you wanna take your time. Uh, I think you have about 30 minutes to drink it, but it's, it's helpful that you don't try to just chug it down because that can create some nausea. If you have a history of nausea uh, with preps, Talk with your doctor, there may be some medications they can give you beforehand that can be helpful. All right, so you mix that up. It actually doesn't smell bad at all. Um, and then you... Wow. That's good. That's good. So you'll drink more than that, but that's the essential purpose. And when you're, and when you're doing the prep, you can also mix it up with other liquids. Sports drinks, soft drinks, uh, sparkling waters. You can have any sort of clear liquids like that that can help you. It doesn't have to be just water, and that can be helpful. Heart candies, jellos, those will be other things that can help you during your preparation, all right? All right, so let's come on over, and once you arrive, after you've taken the prep, you're gonna be taken into a pre-procedure room. And it's important that you follow all the instructions from your doctor about the prep to make sure it works best for you. You'll come into a room um, the day of the procedure. Uh, you will uh, be asked to bring a list, if not actual medications that you take on a daily basis. That includes prescriptions, that includes uh, supplements, 
Anything that you take on a regular basis, we want to see that when you arrive for the procedure. You also want to leave all your valuables at home. So don't bring expensive jewelry, expensive clothes or things like that because you want to bring clothes easy to put on, easy to take off, okay? You're gonna place all of your items in a bag. You're gonna get a lovely gown that you're gonna wear with some footies. You'll be asked to undress everything off except for this gown and these footies, all right? And you'll give everything to your friend or your family member that's gonna be waiting here with you. You also want to bring a form of ID, also your driver's license or your um, insurance card. You wanna bring all that information with you. When you arrive in this space, you're gonna have an IV placed by the nurse. You're gonna meet one of the nurses. They're gonna take all your medical information. They're gonna get you connected to a monitor that's gonna be looking at your heart during the procedure. Uh, they'll be looking at your blood pressure during the procedure. But the toughest part of this day, after you've gotten through the prep, it's gonna be getting the IV. And the nurses are pretty good about getting it in, uh, but for some, that's the toughest part of the day itself, is just getting the IV in. And once you get the IV in, it's just a nap from here, okay? So once you leave this space here, you go into the procedure room. You won't be walking, you'll be on a stretcher on a bed. and you'll come into a procedure room and you'll meet more of the staff in the procedure room. So not only will you have a nurse with you, you'll have a surgical technologist as well as a member of the anesthesia team. And the anesthesia team, they're gonna be watching your heart rate, your blood pressure. They're gonna give you the sedation to make sure that you're comfortable during the procedure. 99% of the time, you'll be getting medication called propofol or diprovan. It's a medication that's gonna really give you that really deep sleep, that nap that most people brag about after having this procedure. And this is not a terribly painful procedure. You won't really have the sensation of like a general surgical procedure. You may have some tiredness when you awaken, but you shouldn't have pain during the procedure. So anesthesia is watching you throughout, throughout the entire procedure. And your doctor is standing on this side of the table. You're here. You're lying on your side facing the wall and your doctor is looking at every image onto the screen that's in front of him. We will take about 25, 30 minutes of the time performing the actual colonoscopy. And that's done with the colonoscope, which you can see here. Your colon is probably about as tall as you are if you were to take it and stretch it. And so this particular scope goes through that entire large intestines or the colon. If you can see, there's a light on the end of that scope. There's also a port or channel that's gonna help us irrigate and also suction. We're insufflating your colon like you would a balloon so that we can expand and see every part of the large intestines. We're looking for colon polyps. These are little bumps that are left to grow can become things like cancer. So we'll place this scope through the bottom throughout the entire large intestine. If we find polyps, if we find any abnormalities, most of the times during the colonoscopy, we can use the same instrument to perform biopsies, or we can also remove any uh, smaller sized polyps that we may find. Um, any of those things that we remove, we send to the lab, they look at it under the microscope, they tell us a little bit more about what the nature of that particular polyp could be. But the procedure itself, again, takes about 25 plus or minus minutes to do. You don't remember any of it, you are asleep, and you are protected during the procedure because again, we have anesthesia here, we have nurses here, uh, people often get concerned about their privacy. Listen, there are lots of sheets here. You're gonna be covered up. The only person standing on this side of the table is your doctor and the surgical technologist who's gonna make sure that you're you know, protected and that you're in a safe space, okay? All right, so we're gonna head out now from here to the recovery room. And again, you're gonna be pretty sleepy, but the good part about using this sedation is that once you are um, awakening from the procedure, you wake up pretty quick without a lot of um, grogginess, all right? So you're gonna be in the recovery room. You'll be here for at least 30 minutes or until you are awake and ready to go home. You do need someone to drive you home after the procedure. Uh, but while you're in the recovery room, you'll be continually monitored 
your blood pressure, your heart rate. We're going to continue to make sure that you're not having more pain, that you're waking up the way you should. Your family members will be here or your friends will come back. We'll talk about what we found and what the next steps are. We'll give you contact information, how to reach us. If you have any questions, once you leave, if you have problems, this is how you find me. Um, after you have the colonoscopy, if there's no family history of colorectal cancer and it was completely a normal examination, it may be 10 years before you have another colonoscopy. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer, it may be five years before we do another colonoscopy if it were a normal exam. If we find polyps, we're going to need to talk about when we need to do this again. And that may mean we have a visit in a week or two where we go through the pathology report. We talk about what we found and what we need to do about it. So it may mean that you have another colonoscopy in three years, five years, or perhaps even sooner depending on the type and the number of polyps. If the polyp or a larger mass was found that could not be removed during the colonoscopy procedure, it may mean you need to have surgery. All right? So that's why it's important that we have a follow-up conversation to talk about what we found and what the next steps are. And most of us will give you a printed report that will have some pictures and have a full explanation of what happened during the procedure itself. But all in all, the procedure itself is fairly well tolerated and you'll probably spend about half a day with us by the time you check in, by the time you have the procedure, and by the time you wake up. But once you go home, you can generally eat what you like. No driving that day, but the next day you're generally, you're generally good to go. Most people like to take off from work the day before or the day um, after, depending on the job, but you don't necessarily have to take off you're gonna be pretty much awake and alert the next day, so you can still return to work the day after your colonoscopy. Um, if you have questions after watching this video, please contact us by the contact information listed below, and hopefully this helps you as you prepare for your very important colonoscopy.